Okay, so the next presentation, Miguel, so the stage is yours. Miguel? Oh. Okay. So I'm Miguel Gomez Amayoa. Um, in this paper, we, we present what we believe is a further improvement to partial order reduction methods. And that we, we think it uh, is also complementary to, to recent uh, other improvements. Uh, so uh, a little bit of introduction. So it is well known that when it comes to do um, some kind of systematic exploration of a program's behavior in a concurrent program, then for, for verification or for, for testing, then there is a well-known state explosion problem due to non-deterministic interleavings. And well, partial order reduction techniques, uh, they are able to identify um, equivalent executions. And for instance, in an example like this, we have three processes, PQR, with these instructions. So here, uh, in, in, I mean, if we do uh, an exhaustive exploration, then we will have uh, 30 traces. And partial order reduction is, is able to identify that many of them are actually equivalent. And, and actually, in this example, there are only four different uh, equivalent traces producing different results. And that's mainly because there are only, out of the seven events that we have here, uh, the five events that we have here, then only three of them are actually interacting. And also, if we have a closer look, then we can see that these two events are really do not interacting because they are reading a variable but do not writing over it. So basically here what happens, I mean, we are interested in the final values of variables y and z, and depending on whether this execution, this statement is, is done before or in the middle, then we will get different results. And there are only four different, right? So let us review some basic concepts of, of partial reduction. So um, one of the central relations is that of the independency relation or dependency. So we say that two events, two instructions, two uh, transitions are independent if they do not enable each other. And if um, in, for every state in which we, we can execute both uh, consecutively, then uh, we, can, we are going to get the same result uh, reversing their order. Um, and then with that, well, this is an example. So uh, here in our example, again, we can, we can see that, for instance, the Q2 and R2, these two instructions, though they are accessing the same variable, they are reading them. So um, these are really independent, because for every state in which you run consecutive, consecutively both, then you will lead to the same state. But however, P1 is dependent to Q2, for instance. And that's because, depending on whether you do this before or not, you will end up with the final different variable uh, value for variable y. So with this uh, dependency relation, then we build this happens before relation. This is the typical one. So basically, in a sequence of statements, if we have these two transitions, and, and this one goes before the other, and they are dependent, then we say that we have a happens before relation. This is a partial order re relation, and that's why this is the name of, of these techniques. And basically, the theory says that executions with the same happens before relation are equivalent. Now, the challenge of these techniques in the last decades was to uh, have been to find ways of computing this on the fly and effectively. And so the, the challenge is, is in, of course, in generating at least one. This is for completeness. And the, for effectiveness, one ideally wants to generate only one trace per equivalence class. And let us review some history. So in, in, the, in the 80s, with the, in the 90s, sorry, with the, with the birth of the first software model checkers, um, well, several static POR methods were developed, and actually uh, part of these works, uh, they received the 2014 CAF award. And then, uh, well, one of the most relevant works was the, this one, like Dynamic Partial Order Reduction by Flanagan and Godfrey in this Popple 2005 paper, where they basically, they did an improvement, and, and they were able to, to, to compute these sets dynamically on the fly. This was more uh, effective and also more, um, more precise. So, um, and since then, there, there have been several uh, improvements and adaptations for different uh, contexts. And probably the uh, most relevant ones are these two, uh, the optimal DIPOR in, in this Popple 2014 paper and the super optimal uh, in this Concord paper. And so they are optimal in the sense that they're able to explore only one, um, only one trace per equivalence class. Okay, L let me show you very fast the, uh, how basically the, the original DIPOR algorithm works. 
So the, this is basically a depth-first traversal starting with an arbitrary trace. And the crux of the algorithm is that it is only going to backtrack whenever it finds evidence that there is a need to backtrack because there is a race, that is to say, there is a, a dependency that can be reversed. So in this example, it starts with this, so it goes with P, it goes with the first step of Q, these are not dependent, and now it finds a dependency. We have this uh, second step of Q, which is this one, and this first step of P, and then it finds this dependency, and it, it, it actually notices that this can be reversed, so it, it adds this back backtrack point here. So it's going to add backtrack points whenever necessary and at the appropriate points. It will continue and now it finds another dependency between this R, this is accessing this variable X, and, and, and this P1, which is this one. So it finds this dependency and then it notices that in order to reverse it, it needs to add R here so that it will reverse this parcel order again. So this execution finishes, and we get this parcel order. At the end, we get this result, and now the, ex the, the algorithm now backtracks at the top state. So it continues, and so on. There is no time to show the details, but there are lots of subtleties and, and, and details in these algorithms. They are very, very smart, so it's amazing. I mean, you can be two years studying them, and then you will find new subtleties. And, and so at the, at the end, this algorithm, this is the original one in 2005, is able to, to, to explore these uh, four different traces with four different partial orders of dependent events. But this is not optimal uh, because it is exploring partially a trace until it finds out that it is not, there is no need to continue this trace. So in general, there will be some explorer sequences eventually cut by so-called sleep sets. And this is where the optimal work improves. This, uh, this algorithm. So the optimal deep or algorithm is able to notice here at this point in this uh, dependency that there is no need to add R at the top state to backtrack there because whatever you are going to do starting with the first step of R, you can do it also starting with the first step of Q. Okay, so the thing is this algorithm is able to avoid exploring this, um, uh, this, this, this rightmost uh, path of this tree. And in general, I mean, it looks like, okay, it's just uh, three states that you have reduced. But in general, I mean, when you, you put this into uh, bigger examples, so with this example, uh, instead of having two readers, you have eight readers, then this difference is, is huge. I mean, it, it is like uh, getting 256 traces, whereas more than 3,000. So small improvements in these algorithms can produce a huge uh, improvements than when it comes to do bigger explorations. And this is now where we enter the picture. So we observe two uh, different places where there is room for automation. So one is in the so-called dependency over approximation. So the thing is, um, this algorithm is all the time, I mean, when it is uh, looking for dependencies all the time, looking back into the trace, looking for dependencies. But the definition of dependency, as I stated it at the, at the beginning and as it is defined, is, is not computable. I mean, because it tells that for all, all possible state in which you execute whatever. So it, this is not applicable in practice like it is, so it needs to be somehow over approximated, right? And this is what happens in this example. This is another example, right? And even simpler. So we have P, Q, and R, and these two instructions, well, uh, in general, uh, yeah, these, these, these two instructions, they're writing the same value on the same variable. So the thing, when, whenever you want to over-approximate the, the traditional way of doing it the, with this kind of language is that you will say that two events can be dependent if they're accessing the same variable and one of them is a right, one, at least one of them is right. And, and actually, in this example, all pairs of instructions that you can consider here, they will be all dependent, okay? And therefore, uh, all traditional methods will have to generate the six, uh, the six uh, orderings because they are relying on, on this traditional over-approximation. Okay, it's true, you could improve it. This is what we are arguing, that if you are able to improve this over-approximation somehow, you could use different static analysis or whatever, then you, you will be able to, to collapse these uh, equivalence classes together and these two, and then uh, uh, having four. And therefore, you will be able to explore four with the original uh, optimal algorithm. But this could be more tricky. I mean, here we are writing the same variable, but you could have an increment and a decrement assuming that they are atomic. And then, of course, these two will, again, uh, will be uh, independent. 
or it could be much more difficult because you would have you could have uh, bigger atomic sections of code and then it is very difficult to prove that uh, they actually commute for all possible states okay this is just an observation and now the second one second observation is that in an example like this one um, events q and r q and r are clearly dependent because they are accessing the same variable one is writing it and actually if you do this before or not then you will have a different result, but they are not always dependent. They are dependent in most states, but there is a state, there is a context in which they are not dependent, they are independent. So if you are in the context where x equals 5, then these two events are actually independent. Right? Q and R are independent if x is already 5. And the same happens with P and R. So if we can exploit this, if we are able to exploit this during the dynamic parcel order with X algorithm, then we can detect that these two uh, traces, here we have already executed P, so we have X equals 5, and then these two are independent in this context. If we can see that, if we can exploit that, then these two will be um, equivalent, these two will be equivalent, and then we will end up getting to these two equivalence classes, and then hopefully you will be able, or ideally, you will be able to, to explore only two traces for an example like this. Okay, so and this is what we have been able to do, at least uh, we have been able to do it in some way that we believe it has been reasonable and we get good results. It could be done in many different ways because you can try to exploit, it, exploit this in many different ways. So we have proposed what we call the context-sensitive dynamic parcel order reduction, which is a refinement over the optimal dynamic parcel order reduction, and it is able to take advantage of these context-sensitive dependencies, and at the same, with the same price, it is able to Im overcome this loss of precision of dependency over approximations. And with this algorithm, the exploration can only get reduced. So now I'm going to show you in an example, in this example, how basically uh, we, we make the difference and where and how. So here, we start, we do P, now we do Q, here the algorithm, I mean, we are going to do the same as the standard algorithm, but we are going to add a new check, okay? And if this check succeeds, then we will try to uh, reduce some exploration. So uh, the algorithm now finds out that this, there is a dependency, I mean, the standard dependency, and then it will, it will put this backtrack point here, and we do this. But what we do now, we already, we check that if PQ produces the same result as the one QP, okay, and we are going to have to do it anyway. QP is going to be uh, done later. So we just advance this computation, and then we observe the real result with a real run. And, and, and we see if there is the same result, then we annotate here that we should not explore Q followed by P at this state. This is what we do. Now we continue. And the same happens here. We have this dependency, Q and R, and then we check whether at this state doing QR is the same as doing RQ. And it is the same. We get the same result. And then we annotate here that we should not explore R followed by Q because we have evidence that they will lead to the same result in this context. So we are exploiting these context-sensitive dependencies. Now we continue, we get to this result, and so on. Now, at this point, we are now taking advantage of this. Now, this is a, we are using here the, the so-called slip sets, but now with sequences. So we are propagating this information. Now we do R, and therefore here we should not pick Q. This is what, what is telling us this information. And here we are not taking this state, so we are avoiding exploring this state. Okay? And remember that in this example, all traditional methods uh, will have to explore the six sequences, right? Okay, now we continue, and here we are taking advantage of this thing. Don't do Q followed by P. Okay, we start, we do the Q. What we cannot do is both things. Now we cannot do P at this point. Okay, we can do R, we continue, and then we will avoid this uh, trace. We will avoid exploring this trace. Now the algorithm will continue here, and again it will detect that at this state PQ uh, really commutes in this context, not in all contexts. Well, in, no, this, well, for P and Q is all contexts. And now we will uh, produce this result, but we will avoid getting this result. So we are we are getting um, three explored sequences. So we are having a, actually an extra one. Uh, so this could be actually improved, but it is not clear whether it will be worth it. 
So in the paper, we present uh, with, all of, with all the details this algorithm. Um, we show a step-by-step -step example, and then we use a bigger example where we can observe the algorithm's potential, because with these tiny examples, then you cannot observe the real potential. But the thing is, we can get exponential redu reductions. So this is a producer-consumer, and, and we can observe that with three producers and consumers, then, okay, this is, uh, it doesn't pay off. I mean, we are getting a reduction on the number of states. This is with the optimal, with the traditional one, and this is with the new one, our, our algorithm. So we are getting a reduction on the number of states, but uh, this is not producing less time of reduction. But when we consider, for instance, nine producers, nine consumers, then we can see a huge difference in the number of states. And also, we can observe that now we are getting uh, one order of magnitude of reduction. This is for this example. Um, so in the paper, we also prove the soundness of the approach. We present some optimizations that are very useful when it comes to implement this and put it in, uh, in, to work in practice. We report on our implementation for actors, and, and we report on experimental results. So um, let me finish by showing you uh, a clean example. This is the motivated example that actually motivated this work two years ago. We, we, we found this, and then we started to work on, on this thing. So th that was, this is an actor's program. This is a distributed merge sort algorithm. So you have an array. You want to, to sort the array, and then you divide the array into halves, and then you send each part to, to a different worker. Okay? Then the workers will sort them, and then uh, they, will, they will return their halves to you, and then you will have to merge the results and then send the result back to your caller. So what happens there? It happens that okay, you start to divide the array, and then at some point, in each of these workers, then there is a non-deterministic choice, which is uh, which one finishes earlier, uh, this worker or the other one. And then, in principle, you have to consider both things. But you know that this is going to lead to the same result, because merging with these two arguments or the other way around is going to lead to the same result. But this is not, I mean, it is very difficult to prove this, because actually this is only true whenever the, the, the arrays are sorted. I mean, merge is only producing the same result if they are sorted. So it is not, not easy to prove it. So the thing is, in this example, with eight numbers in the, L in, in the array, then um, there are two up to seven possible orderings. And all traditional algorithms would have to explore all of them. And all of them lead to the same result, of course. And our algorithm is able, is able to, to notice that you are going to get the same result here, same result here, and then it's going to explore many sequences, but at the, at the end it's going to produce only one complete sequence and it's going to save a lot of computation effort. So with, uh, with, other, um, with more data, I mean, this is with eight, so we are getting only one execution. We, are, we need to explore 143 states, whereas here it was two, more than 2,000. But if we increase the n, we have 15 elements in the array, then we can see that the reduction is huge. I mean, we are getting now three orders of magnitude in time, okay, and, and well, similarly on a number of states. So this is what uh, we have proposed. So. Um, mm, it remains to be seen how useful it is for, for real programs, because we have been able only to try it on, on rather small programs and with, in the actor's uh, setting. But we will see, hopefully, in the following years. <laughs> Thank you very much. So time for one short and maybe two questions. And maybe the next speaker can go and set up. In the uh, tables with the experimental results, you are showing optimal uh, DPR with a star. Uh, that is without wake-up trees? Yeah. So that is source DPR, right? It's an optimal. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is, um, well, yeah, in, in the all the, all the tables that I'm showing, I'm oh, sorry, um, I'm considering the um, results of the optimal without wake-up trees. So in, in the optimal paper, there are two basic, basic two improvements. One is the source sets, the other is the, the wake-up trees. So the thing is, um, it is much easier to implement the source version. So this is the one that we have implemented to, to get the results. And also, there is no clear evidence that really wake-up trees 
uh, produce better results. I mean, because if you look at, if you look at the experiments in the, in the Popel paper of, of Abdullah, then you can observe that actually the results are not better. I mean, they are, I mean, they reduce some states, but you don't get really better times. So, and also it is not easy to, to put this together into an algorithm. It is possible, but not easy. In any case, the, the improvements that you can get with the wake-up trees will be complementary to, to the improvements that you get thanks to our context-sensitive relation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a, another question. So, uh, one optimization you make is to uh, check for whether two uh, seemingly dependent operations need not be reversed. And then you annotate an extended sleep set with some sequences. Correct? Um, you put sequences in the notes on one of the slides. Um, I mean, one of the Yes, one of the optimizations that we do is that we try to avoid recomputing things because right now, I mean, the way it is presented, we are recomputing, th we are recomputing things. So, 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 as I understand it, you are putting sequences that you don't want to explore. So, did you check how this relates to the wake-up trees of the optimal algorithm? Yeah, um, as I was saying, I mean, the, uh, that depends on, but uh, I mean, the wake-up trees works on, an on another um, dimension. So uh, we will benefit from wake-up trees. Yes, that's right. But wake-up trees cannot uh, cannot really infer these uh, um, context-sensitive dependencies. So it remains to be seen as well uh, whether, I mean, depending on the examples, maybe there will be, uh, there will be examples where with wake-up trees we'll get less benefit or more. So who knows? So it's difficult to know and it's, it's difficult to, to also to try out. Uh, sorry, uh, let me suggest to yeah. put this offline. Yeah. So let's thank uh, Nika again and so we need to sort out the connection.